I used to have a collection of bells in my office. I have them now at, now at home, ranging from a very small Christmas type bell to one about this big. And, and I, I use them in various venues, but when John Smith and I, where's John? Uh, when, when we had the hypertext conference, he had a bell and I had a bell and we had disagreements about which bell we ought to ring. And so we alternated at the end of each break. One time it was his bell and one time it was my bell. But I'm, I'm delighted to, to uh, moderate this panel. We've brought together four really uh, uh, amazing scholars from a variety of areas. Let me give you quick introductions. You'd rather hear them than listen to me. Uh, Penny Reingantz. Penny is a, a PhD recipient from this department. She was, uh, did her work under Fred and was the 100th PhD from this department. Thank you. <laughs> she uh, has worked with EPA, with the University of Mississippi, right? With the uh, University of Maryland, College Park, or not College Park, uh, Baltimore County, I got the wrong letters, and uh, is now uh, chair of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maine. Uh, to her left is Amita Varshney, and he also got his PhD here with, with Fred and is, has continued to work in high performance graphics. And he is currently, now I have to read this because there are a lot of words. He is currently Dean of the College of Computer, Mathematical and Natural Sciences and Professor of Computer Science at the University of Maryland College Park. Over here is uh, Sam Williamson. Sam has a degree from Harvard and it is, is, is a, or an historian. And his specialty is the history around the World War I. And in fact, uh, for his research, actually interviewed the last surviving assassin of Archduke Ferdinand. That was the, the event that precipitated the, the, the First World War. Uh, Sam was the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences during a very important part of the, our department's history in the late 70s and, and, and 80s. And uh, a lot of good things happened under his watch, including Citizen Hall, and, and also his enlightened dealing with faculty recruiting led to what we still call the Williamson Rule. So uh, we're delighted to have Sam here. And by Zoom, we have Ivan Sutherland, and, and he's one who either needs no introduction or a very long one. So. But Ivan says he's a, a visiting scientist at Portland State and is uh, received his PhD from MIT and uh, is the one and only honorary recipient of an of a honorary doctorate in computer science from the University of North Carolina in the 120 some years history of the university. There's only been one and that's Ivan. And, and to, to, to quote Fred, uh, few people have had more influence on this department's research direction than Ivan. He's a member of the National Academy, Turing Award recipient, lots more. So uh, I'm just going to turn it loose now and see, uh, see what happens. Let me begin by saying I'm delighted to be back here and have this chance to meet many of you some of whom I've not seen for years. Fred and I were both graduate students at Harvard. I was on the slow track, he was on the very fast track. He, he got on and he went through and then did IBM and then he did, came to Chapel Hill in the 1960s, became the first department chairman and then left an extraordinary career which we're celebrating today. I happened to meet him a couple of times but then that was, uh, I, I finished a graduate degree and then I was in the army for three years teaching at West Point. And then I went back to Harvard for three more years, six, six more years as a junior faculty, always at Harvard. You're always hoping, but it never happens. Uh, uh, and in any case, I came to Chapel Hill in 72 with a huge degree and a chance to be a, a tenured professor. Well, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. This case 
And within the first year of being here as an assistant professor, I was offered a job as a full professor at Michigan. But that wasn't very hard to decide. Uh, I decided, stayed here. And then I met, and then I met Fred Brooks. And I said, well, who is this guy, Fred Brooks? I don't know. And it turned out that became a multiple explosion of relationships in various different ways. One of the first one was that I knew that Fred had spent a year in Cambridge and I asked him about his son having, Roger having gone King's College School and what kind of an experience that had been for Roger. Wonderful experience. My son George went there and had a good time. Then he came back in 72. Here's the dean and the College of Arts and Sciences. I arrived here late in the academic year. I came in the middle of February, middle of January, middle of this, I'll get it right, and in the middle of the summer, having taken a whole year at Cambridge. It didn't take very long for me to figure out that on the people I ought to know very well was Fred Brooks. Didn't take him very long to figure out how to get to know him too. And that then began what I would call the interesting relationship between whether I was working for Fred or whether Fred was working for me. <laughs> and we never quite solved that, but we sort of it, it kept it tension, a certain amount of tension, a certain amount of obligation to each other. But we had an extraordinary relationship that was never won by opposite surprise. The, the, the administrator hates, of all things, have surprise. Being surprised will kill all relationships. And I didn't, we didn't have that with Fred. But Fred did come with some very interesting my, uh, ideas very much in my first week, week as dean. He said, Sam, he said, the faculty here is not very happy with things. Nothing ever happens. It seems that you need to get something done. And I said, well, Fred, what do you mean? He said, well, just get something done. And uh, that was about the way he often did things, just to get things going. But in this case, he said, why don't you do five or six ideas and revamp the curriculum? And we did that two years and a half. We finished that curriculum. It stayed in place at Chapel Hill for 25 years. Got through the faculty without much problem. There was a little vision professionalism here and there, but that got through. Fred was happy with that. The next thing, the, the next stage was Fred was unhappy with the fact that the computer science department was not getting the kind of attention he thought. It wasn't have it didn't have enough space. It was a pretty bad space. It didn't have it didn't have enough people. Didn't have enough money. And it was still, I think he would say, too much formatted on the big computer. And that he said he knew already that was not where the thing was going to go in the long haul. And he kept pushing me back. He said, Sam, do something about that. And he said, just do it. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what are the ne negatives on this? And he said, well, there'll be a little bitching here and a little bitching there, but it does go on. And so I did. We said we're going to keep up, we could support two creative, two computers or two programs or three, but that's it. We've got a lot of new computers coming out there. We're just not going to support them. That's what we did. We didn't support them. They fitted away and we started, I forgot which ones there were. We probably, probably would have been IBM, but that was already a pain for, for Fred and for me and for others. But in any case, that made the move. The next time we got ready was a different game altogether. They said, the faculty was saying, we want computers, we want computers, we want computers. Well, where was the money? Chapel Hill was paying poor at that point. It's occasionally played poor a lot of times, but, but in any case, we said, oh, we'll try to, we'll try to, to start the whole thing with slow motion, getting the thing going. And that took time, but we again said, 
pick out two or four computers, and that's all we're going to deal, deal with. That worked more or less. And then by 1982, 83, you thought you've been working this nine, 10 years, we thought about it, when sometimes something good. Well, the world didn't think we had, and there were some reasons. Again, we had no space, a lack of space, lack of computers, lack of people, lack of confidence, and no real concision, consensus about what the long-term computer world ought to be at the University of South Carolina, North Carolina. That took a time, and some of that wound up going on for years and years afterwards. But Fred again said, let's don't do anything with the computer science department at the front of this. Let's have it hidden. Get other people. Get, other, get somebody from psychology. Get somebody from sociology. Get another people living this. And then we'll do this, and we'll reach out and try to get everybody involved in this way. I don't know whether that was true for many of you on your campuses, but at Chapel Hill, over time, we managed to get people involved across the way. Me bringing English department, mathematics department, all those kind of things that had been neglected or at least had been thought about. And Fred, and we've heard earlier, Fred, but in many cases may have said, cut it off when they do that. But some other people kept going, uh, and it, so it did. But in all of this, Fred always thought about what's the ramification? What are we going to be able to do with this in interesting stuff? And in that, I found as dean and in the latest prophecy that Fred was always going to take care of the people, the faculty, the students who worked for him. And now y'all have reiterated it. This began today, talking about your experiences with him. It was a great experience for me, great experience for Joan and me to know the Brooks and to have this a chance to sort of see how something really works. Never seen it work quite as well ever again. Probably won't. Thank you. I reminded Sam that I was on uh, his advisory committee while he was dean. And I really liked the way he ran meetings. This was an advisory committee, a committee to give him advice. He would listen to us talk. And at some point he would say, okay, I've heard the advice. And we'd stop. It wouldn't let the conversation run forever. And when I reminded him of that, he said, I got that from Fred. <laughs> Ivan, tell us about your interactions with Fred. Well, Fred was definitely a, a hero in my mind. He, he was kind. I think if you want to say one word about Fred, the word I would use was kind. He thought about the needs of people, and then he tried to make those people productive by providing things that could make them productive. And I think above all, Fred knew that it's people who changed the course of science and technology. It's individuals, every individual matters. And, and the, the, the purpose of graduate school, I think, is to allow individuals to take their place and realize that they can change the world too. And we've heard today, we've heard about a bunch of people who did brand new things and were encouraged by Fred to do them. I, I like the expression that says, don't talk about it, be about it. In other words, get on with the work. Now, Fred uh, called me up one day and he said, would you, would you consider taking a, a honorary degree? And this is sort of like asking, you know, is the Pope a Catholic? Of course I would. I mean, what a, what a, what an honor for Fred to say, would you take an honorary degree? Now I have to tell you the story that I will never forget that honorary degree. I addressed appropriately for the occasion. Now, <clears throat> Fred, however, did. I was in Australia visiting Craig Mudge who appeared in an earlier session. And I heard that there was to be a convocation at University of North Carolina where 
graduates of a university, PhDs from the university were asked to come and talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. And I had not obtained an invitation. No invitation came to me. My friend Craig Mudge had an invitation, but I didn't have an invitation. So I called up Fred and said, yes, Fred, I'd be delighted to come and give a talk. Oh, he said, oh, yes, of course. I said, uh, he'd forgotten, but I had not forgotten that I had a degree from North Carolina. And so I came and gave a talk. And that talk is now available on the web. You can have a look at it. And Fred gave a, a very nice introduction to me in which he said that his view of computing and his displays as a window into a world that is of your own making. You can have different laws of physics. You can understand what the shapes of molecules are. You can feel what they're like when they come closer together and attract each other. That's a world that you create. And the, the visual display, the, the screen on the computer, gives you a view into that world. I've spent this morning having a view into what's going on in North Carolina. It's been a splendid view. Thank you all for, you know, reminiscing about this great man. And so I've given you one reminiscence about him and, and as time goes on, perhaps we'll have some more. Thank you. Kenny, uh, you, you worked with the chairman and now you, I, I remember as an undergraduate, you could buy a greeting card to send to your parents that said, when I started, I didn't know how to spell engineer and now I are one. So now that you are a chairman, chairperson, uh, tell us about your experience. So I pretty regularly, uh, I'm conscious of how my best moments as a faculty member, as a chair, as an advisor, have their roots, have those echoes in my relationship with Dr. Fred, right? I, I, as many children of parents or parents who are also children do sometimes, I hear his words coming out of my mouth in the best possible way. And there's a whole cluster of these that are about his identity as a wordsmith, right? How he, how he viewed the language and communication, his the importance of precision and language, to this day, I am very clear on when you use between and when you use among. I can tell you this. Uh, there, was a, there was a sort of well-regarded video in probably the late 80s and visualization. It was very flashy. It had visualization and it had sonification and it was drama. And you know, he, he looked at this and, and he said, well, it's all well and good except for the title. They named it, well, it was about acid rain. They named it Caustic Sky. Caustic is base, right? That precision of language and the, the, the clarity of thought that you get through writing. So we, we were scheduled to meet month or weekly. And he said, you need to come and bring something you have written that week or don't come. So I would always bring something that I had written. Um, early on when I was just had this glimmer of what a dissertation might be. He said, well, what you should bring next time is bring the first chapter as if it's done, right? And I, my eyes got big and I goggled. He says, no, if you don't haven't done it yet, write it as you wish it to be. If everything works out the best possible way, what is it? And that's your guidestone. That's your guidepost of where you're going. Um, but often the things that I would write and the things that I would give him would, would come back dripping in green, <laughs> right? Which it, it eventually I came to believe, and this may not have happened until after I left graduate school, just what a gift, the degree to which he commented and, and what a gift that was to me. Um, it was a little bit of an uncomfortable gift, but, but it was a gift. Uh, though he never explained this, but I was a firm believer that the reason he used green is if he used the more standard red, it would look like someone had bled all over the paper, right? And this meant he could give you his comments. He could give you his criticisms, which are sometimes pointed kindly and in the color of sort of growth and rebirth. 
And I thought that was another kind of kindness and another kind of gift. Um, so I have so many memories of um, Dr. Fred, but let me first start by uh, saying something which I have been feeling since I came to this um, event. So for the last 60 years, um, you can't think of the department without thinking of uh, Dr. Fred, but I would also like to add, you can't think of Dr. Fred without thinking of the department. So one of the things um, I really want to say is a huge thank you to all the teachers who have been here, who have been a part of the department, who have been teaching, giving selflessly so much of themselves to all of us. And a lot of them are in this room right now. So I wanted to just um, hope all of you would join me in giving kudos to all of our teachers. Another thing I wanted to add is, so I, I remember I was at SIGGRAPH once and um, Dr. Fred was there with um, one of his two sons. Um, they both look alike. They both look clones of Dr. Uh, Fred. So I don't know if it was Roger or Ken, um, but um, he turned to uh, me and said, I have only three of them, but I have 25 of you. So I also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Fred's family for sharing him with all of us for so many years. So one of the things that um, Ivan was mentioning is about his caring and about his um, looking out for what would be best for someone else. So I had an experience on this I wanted to share with you. I don't think I've shared this with anyone uh, at this point up until now. So the very first paper I published was at IEEE Visualization in San Jose in 1991. And I show up there, I land from the airport, I, you know, and that's when I started having fever and went to a emergency room and they told me, you have chicken pox. So now I'm stuck there. Um, I haven't presented my paper. Um, I go, I track down Dr. Fred Brooks and I say, I am down with chicken pox. He says, well, um, when is your paper? And I said, well, it's tomorrow. He said, give me your slides. So remember at those times we had these physical hard mounted slides. So I give him the slides and he said, okay. Um, I also carried with me a printout of the slides. So he and I went over all the slides and he said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll you know, present for you. And then he said something which really struck me. He said, so what will you do now? I said, I guess I'll be stuck in this um, hotel for the next three weeks. The doctors have said you can't leave because you know, this, you're gonna be going on a plane and that's not good. So then I was stuck there and he said, well, you know, if you are feeling sick, of course you should rest. But if you don't have anything else to do, why don't you start writing? And here is my laptop. And he gave me his laptop for three full weeks. And to me, that was always struck me as something where he really genuinely cared to have each of us reach our maximum potential, our maximum capacity. Um, and the same thing happened a few years later. So then after I, you know, I was about to graduate, I went up to him and he, I said, look, I have gotten this interview from here and here. And he said, well, let me tell you something. You, you have a very strong Indian accent. I said, yes, I do. And, and he said, let me help you fix it. So don't say um, component, say component. And then he went around telling me, coaching me on how to fix my accent. And, and I think it, it worked because I got the job I was you know, interviewing for. But ever since then, I have always followed his uh, advice. And now all the students who graduate from my lab have an Indian accent. I teach them. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have an accent of your advisor. <laughs> so so in, in general, I think it was a really uh, amazing experience. And over the years, I've been in touch. Uh, I've been in touch with him. 
uh, we would often talk on the phone. Um, I would meet him often, and he was always very generous and always cared, deeply, deeply cared for everyone around him. Organizations tend to assume the personality of their leader. And I think the University of North Carolina CS department is exactly that. It has assumed the personality of its leader. It's a nice place to be. People care about each other. People like being with them. They celebrate each other's success. And that is what Fred instilled without hardly trying in what that department is. I've been in a number of places and many of them are dog eat dog. If you make good, that means I'm not making good. We have only so many tenure slots. And so if you make one, I'm not going to. And, and that's not a comfortable place to be, not a comfortable way to live. And I think the important legacy that Fred has left, and you guys enjoy it, is that legacy of kindness and cooperation, which is rampant in your department. So let me add on to that. At the risk of being blasphemous, let me share a time when Dr. Fred was not actually helpful. All right. So this was maybe about 10 years ago. I was at a place not where I am now, where I was frustrated and I thought people were only looking out for their own interests and I, I, I needed it to be better. Right? I needed the place that I was at to be healthier and better. And I was here in Chapel Hill. And so I went to the smartest person I knew to ask his advice. I'm at this place. It's broken in these ways. How can it, how can it be better? How can we fix it? And he kind of looked at me and he said, I have no idea. You just build it right from the first, from the first and then that's how it is. There's a, an aphorism that I think describes that. And it says, your vibe attracts your tribe. And, and that's exactly what Fred did. I know I'm not supposed to. I know I'm not supposed to talk, but I'm going to. <laughs> oh. One of the, when, when I would talk to faculty candidates, I would tell the following joke because this was not true of our department. The, the joke is these two guys are running from a bear and one of them stops to put on his sneakers and the other one says, that won't help, you can't outrun the bear. And the other one says, I don't need to outrun the bear, I just need to outrun you. <laughs> that was not true of this department. And it wasn't true of this university. And under, under uh, deans like Sam, uh, it, was, it promoted a spirit of cooperation rather than competition. And the fact that anybody could be promoted and anybody could get tenure based on how well they did and not how well they did in comparison with anybody else. Let me add just to that. Brad had a good experience a long way, but he had a sensitive experience that could detect when a per per person had a problem and there was something going on that was not really very effective. And he could move in and make that, that intervention with ease without saying anything, which made me talk to the dean says, I'm gonna do this and I said, do this. And what he was trying to do was trying to encourage those who were maybe failing or having a hard time. And then science, that becomes an easier thing to have a hard time. That Fred would try to talk to the individual, the faculty member, the younger faculty members in particular. He seemed to be particularly able to first this, get, to detect this. And that's a very extraordinary political skill that he seemed to be able to do. And some of you probably didn't agree with him then, and they don't agree with me about it, but he had this experience of sort of, how do you make things work? So 
talking about vibes, I just want to add a, a quick one. Um, after I finished my master's from Chapel Hill, right about as I was about to, I went to Dr. Fred and I said, look, I really want to do work in high performance computing. And I think those two universities uh, might be a better fit for me. What do you think? He said, well, if you want to go there, I will write you a very nice letter. So I applied. Um, he wrote me a very nice letter. I got admitted. Um, and of the two, I by then I had shortlisted it to just one. So I went to that one place and met the advisor who I was going to work with, met, met the students. Um, and I think this um, thing, which Ivan just talked about, the vibe draws the tribe. Um, the vibe I got there was just so, um, um, you know, shark infested water, so to speak. It's, it's a really top notch university, which shall remain nameless for now. But then I, I, I came back with my tail tucked um, <laughs> and said, Dr. Fred, is it okay if I continue here? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Yes, they say once you've tasted ambrosia, you don't want to live on ordinary food. So riffing a little bit on his ability to make things work. This is not my story. He told me this story several years ago. Um, this was, so Dr. Fred had this, he, he would nap, right? This is what kept him sharp. And he would take some time out in the day and lay himself on the floor and nap. And that, were, that, was import, that was important for him to function. Um, but then he came to go to on sabbatical in England. And as was his way, he, it was time to nap. He laid himself on the floor. He took his nap. He caused a panic. They called an ambulance. And after that, he put a sign on his door. I'm not dead. I'm just asleep. <laughs> I remember in New West, we had a coffee pot at one end of the hall and the, the sink was at the other end of the hall. And one day uh, somebody was wheeling the cart with down the hall with the, to get more water in the coffee pot and the whole thing tipped over and it happened to be while Fred was napping. And then the next week we had coffee, uh, we had a water spout installed in the, <laughs> in the lounge where the coffee pot was, so we wouldn't have to do that again. We got things done. You talk about Fred being a wordsmith, tell me more. I, I mean, anyone who's read, everyone here has read his stuff. I mean, the, the beauty of his language and the precision of his language. It was a very clear reflection, I think, of the, of the beauty and the precision of the way he, he thought. And, and that's something that he emphasized that, you know, the process of writing clarifies it for you. If you can write it, you have finished thinking it through. And if you can't write it, it means it's not ready, right? You haven't figured out how it works yet. And that, that close linkage between writing and thinking, I think is something I've carried along. So on, on that note um, about the writing, he would advise me, don't use words with Latin uh, roots, use the Anglo-Saxon words, which are simpler and easier to understand. So never use the word demonstrate, use show, and utilize is a double bastardized word. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just use use? Yes, the English language has two languages embedded in one, and that's its power. I mean, in 1066, the Normans, they were French, invaded England and brought with them their language and all the Roman background of that language. And so English is full of Roman words, but you don't, you don't hear children using them and you don't hear children using the passive voice. Johnny will run into his mother and say, I was struck by John. You know, that's not <laughs> what they say. Okay, they say, Johnny hit me, right? 
<laughs> and the active voice is much more powerful than the passive voice. This is a place where Fred and I had a violent agreement. We both <laughs> understood about this important thing about the English language. Now that brings me to another story about where, where I got to work closely with Fred. And the story starts in Washington. I was at a meeting in Washington. I'm not sure what the meeting was, but as, as the meeting was closing, Marjorie Blumenthal came to me and said, the National Academies want a report written for Congress about investment in computing, about the importance of government investment in computing research. Would you be willing to chair it? And I, of course, gave my routine no. She said, darn it, I asked Fred Brooks and he said he wouldn't do it. And on the airplane on the way home, I kind of thought about this and realized this was a pretty important thing because it had to do with how the government might or might not invest in our field. And I knew that this was an important thing to invest in because computing has tentacles into every field of technology and science. You couldn't make injection molded plastic parts if you couldn't compute where the plastic is gonna go when you push it in there. And so computing sort of pervades everything. And so when I got home, I called Fred and I said, you know, Marjorie asked me if I would chair this committee and I, I don't want to do it, but she said, you turn it down too. I'll do it if you'll do it. And he said, okay, he said, I'll do it if you'll do it. So we called Marjorie back and said, we'd be willing to co-chair this committee. And then a remarkable thing happened is we called a bunch of people. We made a list of people that we'd like to have on the committee. We called them one after the other. And of the dozen or so people involved, we got exactly one turn down. Turns out that this person was going to be out of the country for the duration of the study and couldn't possibly work on the study. So everybody else said yes. And we wrote this report, which I looked up on the web because uh, it's now available in the NRC reports are all available for free on the, on the web. And it talk, talks about the future of computing and what needs to be done. Now, I don't know if I can share a screen because I have an extract from that report that I'd like to put up here. Let's see if I can. It says share a screen. I'll try to do that. Yes, that works. And here's the report. Okay, so there you see the most important page of the report. This shows nine areas of computing, each of which became a billion dollar industry. And it tracks the history of when they started and how they went forward. This report was written in the mid nineties. And so it tracks where they started in as research in universities or mostly government sponsored work and government-sponsored work, government-sponsored work. And then people move from that, that kind of research, it mostly in academia, into development in corporations. And that's the dotted lines are corporate developments. And then the, the racing stripes like this are when it became an industrial thing that companies did to make profit. And each of these things turned into a billion dollar industry. Now it takes 15 years. You can see each of these guys, it's so 15 years roughly from when it started, when there was just the germ of an idea until it actually became a profitable thing. And each of those industries is a five-way win. The entrepreneurs win because they get their ideas realized. The public wins because it gets new, new products that it can use. And the employees win because they get jobs. And the government wins because it has a profit sharing plan in place with everybody. And each of these, each of these industries has more than recompensed the federal government for the investment in research that it made. Now this chart was basically the, the collective memory of our committee. And I'm told that it had a major impact on the understanding of the Congress as to the importance of investing money in research. Okay, I think I've done enough on that one. You can so, see so I've got stuff about Fred on this other side of the screen. 
So if I can follow up on Ivan's figure, um, I've, I've seen the descendants of this chart a number of times, and I didn't know that Dr. Fred was connected to it at all until today. So I, I spent six years as a board member of the Computing Research Association. Twice a year, CRA sends um, faculty to go and talk with their representatives in Congress and in the Senate uh, to basically advocate, to tell the story of how what is the importance of computing research for the country, for the industry, for the world. And twice a year, CRA briefs, briefs those faculty members about how you might approach this. You know, faculty members, we like to talk, but we can be kind of freaked out by like politicians and stuff. And they give you a copy of that chart, the tire tracks chart, right? It's cleaned up, it's a little bit prettier. It's that chart that ripples out. That, that thinking of clarity of thinking has been the basis of, at this point, probably thousands of conversations advocating for the importance of computing research. We have reached the end of our allocated time. And I'd like to thank our, our panelists and thank you.